You know that feeling? Like you're just drowning in digital noise. Every notification, every website feels like a constant battle to figure out what's safe. It's uh, honestly overwhelming sometimes. It really is. And that's kind of why we do this, right? Exactly. Welcome to the deep dive. We try to cut through all that noise and focus on what you actually need to know about cybersecurity today. And today we're digging into some really um, practical security problems. We're looking at stuff related to the CompTIA Security X exam. CAS005. Right. But even if you're not thinking about that specific exam. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. The core ideas here, they're fundamental, mm. essential for anyone trying to navigate, you know, the modern security world. Yeah. Our mission isn't test prep. It's about finding those aha moments, getting practical insights without all the super dense technical jargon. Make you make sense. Precisely. So let's jump into the first scenario. Picture this. You're a security analyst. Okay. Staring at network logs. Uh-huh. Seeing lots of activity. Yeah, and some weird IP addresses keep popping up. You need to figure out fast if these are linked to known threats using your SIME system. Right, the security information and event management tool, standard stuff. So what are the options presented? Okay, the material gives four. First, full packet captures. Basically, record everything. Everything, wow. Second, just block all external IPs. Bit drastic, maybe. Yeah, that sounds disruptive. Third, real-time threat intelligence enrichment. And fourth, just ignore outbound DNS requests. Okay, let's break those down. Full packet capture sounds thorough, but um, analyzing all that data later. Seems impossible, right? Like finding a needle in a universe of haystacks. Pretty much. And yeah. blocking all external IPs. How would anything get done? No kidding. Business grinds to a halt. And ignoring DNS, that just feels wrong, like looking away on purpose. It definitely carries risk. And as the source material points out, the winner here is option C real-time threat intelligence enrichment. Why that one specifically? Well, it's proactive, you see. Instead of just logging an IP and maybe analyzing it later, the SIM is checking it right away. Exactly. Against constantly updated lists of known malicious infrastructure, command and control servers, known scanners, things like that, it connects the dots as it happens. Ah, uh, so it flags known bad actors instantly, cutting through the noise of just generally unusual traffic. Precisely. It helps analysts focus on confirmed threats, not just anomalies. Fewer false alarms, faster response. You see an IP, you instantly know if it's on a watch list. Got it. Like having a bouncer at the door with a constantly updated blacklist. Makes sense. And the bigger picture here is integrating that timely threat intel into your operations. It's not just having the intel, it's using it effectively within your tools like the SIME. For much faster, smarter decisions during an incident. You got it. Okay, ready for the next one. Let's do it. Scenario two. A company implements a new data loss prevention policy, a DLP. Good idea, right? Stop sensitive files leaving. Sounds sensible, but... But yeah, suddenly normal work grinds to a halt. People can't send necessary files to partners or clients. Legitimate stuff is getting blocked. Ugh, the classic DLP, growing pains, very common. So what are the potential fixes offered? Okay, four options again. One, whitelist all external domains they work with. Hmm, that sounds potentially risky. What if a partner gets compromised? Good point. Option two, just uh, temporarily disable the DLP policy altogether. Kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Seems like it. Mm -hmm. Option three, block all outbound emails that have attachments. Whoa, that's a sledgehammer approach. Mm -hmm. That would cripple communication for most places. Definitely. So the source material leans towards option B. Option B, yes which is performing data classification to fine tune the policy rules. Data classification. So figuring out what data is actually sensitive. Exactly. That's the core issue often is the DLP policy treating everything like it's top secret. You need to understand your data first. What really needs protecting? What's routine? So instead of a blanket block, you get granular. You identify the crown jewels, the really sensitive stuff. Right. Customer PII, financial records, intellectual property, whatever it is for that company. And then you tailor the DLP rules to protect that specifically while letting less sensitive, necessary business communication flow. Precisely. You classify your data high, medium, low sensitivity, or whatever categories make sense. Then your DLP rules become much smarter, much more targeted. It blocks the truly risky stuff, but allows legitimate business. Reduces those annoying false positives that disrupt everyone. Exactly. It makes the DLP effective without crippling the business. A tuned DLP is way better than a blunt one. Makes total sense. Okay, next up. This one feels a bit more dramatic. Threat hunting time. 
Ooh, okay. An analyst spot something weird. An account that hasn't been used in months suddenly logs in. Okay, dormant account activation. Red flag. And it's accessing critical systems from a foreign IP address yeah, in the I, middle of the night. Yikes. Yeah, alarm bells should be ringing loud and clear. Major indicators of compromise, potentially. So the analyst needs to understand what kind of activity this is. Does it fit known attack patterns? The source suggests looking at four frameworks. Stride. Which is more for threat modeling during design, usually. Right. Then a WASP top 10. Focused on web app vulnerabilities. Not quite right here. Then there's the MITRE ATT and CK framework and the NIST cybersecurity framework. NIST is great, but it's very broad standards, guidelines, best practices for identifying specific attacker actions in progress. MITRE ATT and CK seems like the tool for the job. Option C again. Exactly. MITRE ATT and CK is like um, an encyclopedia of real world adversary tactics and techniques. It catalogs how attackers operate. So it's not just unauthorized access. The analyst can use ATTNCK to see, okay, this dormant account logged in. Then did it try to escalate privileges? Did it use PowerShell for lateral movement? Is it querying Active Directory in a way associated with reconnaissance? Precisely. They can map the observed activity, the login, the system's access, the specific commands, maybe to known techniques within the ATTNCK framework. Tactic T is 0003, persistence, technique T1078. Valid accounts, specifically dormant accounts. Ah, so it gives structure and context to the weirdness? Helps understand the potential intent and the stage of the attack? Absolutely. It moves you from just seeing anomalies to understand the likely playbook the attacker is using. That allows for a much more targeted and effective response. Very powerful for threat hunting and incident response. Cool. Okay, different angle now. Designing a network, a company is going remote first. Very common scenario these days. And their key goals are least privileged people only get access to what they absolutely need and continuous verification to make it harder for attackers to move around internally if they do get in. Reduce that lateral movement risk. Sensible goals for a distributed workforce. So what models are on the table? Four options again. First, traditional perimeter-based security, like the old castle and moat idea. Which feels kind of outdated when the perimeter's everywhere, right? Home offices, coffee shops. Exactly. Second, defense in depth. Layers of security, always good, but... But maybe not specific enough to the trust issue inside the layers. Yeah. Third, zero trust architecture. And fourth, a cloud access security broker, a CASB. Okay, CASB is really focused on securing cloud app usage. Important, but not the whole network architecture picture. Defense in depth is a principle, not really an architecture itself. And perimeter. Yeah. Yeah, not ideal for remote first. So that leaves zero trust architecture. Option C again. Seems popular today. It really is the model that fits these goals best, as the source indicates. The core idea of zero trust is, well, trust nothing implicitly. Assume breach. Kind of. Or rather, assume no inherent trust based on location. Just because you're connected to the internal network doesn't mean you should be trusted. So it's not trust, but verify. It's more like never trust, always verify. That's a great way to put it. Every single access attempt, user, device, application needs to be authenticated and authorized continuously. And access is super granular based on exactly what that user or device needs for that specific task. Precisely. That's least privilege baked right into the architecture. Mm -hmm. Strict access controls, segmentation, continuous monitoring. It directly tackles that lateral movement problem if one account gets compromised. It can't easily hop over to other critical systems because it hasn't been implicitly trusted. Exactly. Its blast radius is contained. It's a fundamental shift away from location-based trust to identity and context-based trust. Mm. Perfect for a distributed modern workforce. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, final scenario. This one's a classic headache. Oh. Healthcare provider. They have these older medical imaging systems, think MRI machines, CT scanners, running on outdated operating systems. And they can't be patched? Nope. Maybe the vendor doesn't support them anymore, or patching could break their FDA validation, whatever. But they have to stay on the network to function. Oof. Yeah, that's a tough spot. High risk. Critical systems, unpatchable vulnerabilities, network connected, what are the mitigation options? Four are presented. One, try to install modern endpoint detection and response EDR software on these old machines. Which might not even be possible, right? The OS might be too old, or it could destabilize the medical device. Risky. Agreed. Option two, increase user permissions on these systems. Wait, increase permissions? That sounds like the opposite of what you'd want to do. Definitely the wrong direction. Option three, implement DNS filtering across the network. 
DNS filtering is good practice generally, helps block access to known malicious sites, but does it directly protect the vulnerable imaging system itself from an attack coming from inside the network, say? Probably not directly, no, which leads to option A. Okay, what's A? Place these systems in their own dedicated VLAN, a virtual local area network, and apply very strict access control lists, ACLs. Ah, uh, segmentation create a little walled garden just for these vulnerable systems. Exactly. The VLAN isolates them from the rest of the network, mm -hmm. and the ACLs act like very specific bouncers at the gate of that garden. So the ACLs would define exactly what other devices on the network are allowed to talk to these imaging systems, and maybe only on specific network ports they need to function. Precisely. You lock it down, only the absolute minimum necessary communication is allowed in or out of that VLAN. Anything else is blocked by default. So. Even though you can't patch the system's core vulnerability, you drastically shrink its attack surface, you make it much harder for an attacker to reach it, and harder for it to be used as a jumping off point if it does get compromised. It's a compensating control, acknowledging you can't fix the root problem, so you build strong defenses around it, makes sense for legacy systems. It really does. It's a practical way to manage inherent risk you can't eliminate. And these aren't just exam topics, right? These are real world challenges. Yeah. The solutions reflect practical security thinking that applies way beyond any test. Absolutely. So thinking about all this, the threat intel, the DLP tuning, zero trust, segmentation, maybe a final thought for you listening right now. What's one thing, even a small thing, you could consider doing differently? Yeah, in your own digital life or at work. Maybe it's being more aware of the data you handle or questioning the access you have or grant, finding that balance between being secure and you know, actually being able to get things done. It's always a balancing act. And the landscape keeps changing. Constantly evolving, which means there's always more to explore, always more to uh, deep dive into next time. What areas are you curious about? 